Good morning and good afternoon for those of us joining from the U.S. Coast. Uh, welcome to the third in our series of webinars. Uh, we're going to take a look at roles, responsibilities today, and we're going to touch briefly on estimating. Um, this is a very big topic, and to try and squeeze all of it in one hour is, um, you know, a big challenge. So we're going to focus more on the roles, responsibilities piece. We'll touch briefly on, on the estimating, and then we're going to revisit estimating in step six when we get into cost. Just as we're getting started, uh, a couple of things. First of all, you'll notice our new template. We have rebranded. Um, so SPM Learning has shifted, dare I say, uh, and we are now Title Shift, with our tagline is Lift Your Organization. Um, so if you go to our website, spmlearning.com, you will be redirected to titleshift.ca, and of course all of our emails and everything is now switching over, and Lauren has been doing a fabulous job on, on taking care of getting everything, so uh, big kudos there. And um, really looking forward to going forward with our new name and um, our new look and feel. So with that, um, we'll just a uh, little bit of housekeeping on the webinar side. In the um, uh, control panel for your webinar, you have a question but button down the bottom with the, the list of icons there. So if you have a question at all during the session, please um, you know, just click on that, type it in. There's the chat window if you want to enter any comments or questions. If you're having any technical difficulties, i.e. you can't hear or um, the sound isn't coming through right, something like that, um, just pop it in the chat window or send an email to Lauren and we will do the best we can to get it sorted out. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that we will be recording this and the recording will be available afterwards. So for all of those of you who are rejoining us, welcome back. And for anyone who's, uh, this is the first session, welcome. Um, if you are joining us for the first time, the first two sessions have been recorded and will be made available to you. Uh, if you just fire us a quick note, we can uh, send you that link. And with all the reminders that we sent out for the future webinars, we also include the links for the past ones, so that that way if you need to catch up on one, if you missed one, uh, you can do that. And of course, a quick note that sometimes the audio does get out of sync with the video, so just um, be patient and, and we should be good. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started then. So our session today is Roles, Responsibilities, and Estimating. It's step three of ten. Um, the subtext here is who's doing what. And as always, I want to start off with an opening thought. And I'm taking this one from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, um, Get the Right People on the Bus. And in their analysis in both Good to Great and um, um, Good to Great, oh, Built to Last, that was the other one. I was actually listening to it this morning. Um, in both of those books, they, they set out initially to research what makes companies make that transition from being a good company to being a great company. And then in their second book, um, Built to Last, what makes a company an enduring company that continues on. And what they came back to was having the right people. And interestingly enough, another of their, their um, success companies in the, in the study, one of them was Sony Corporation. And it started out, they didn't even know what product they were going to create, but they knew they wanted to work together. And the same with HP and, and other um, enduring companies that they used in their study. And what they found was that having the right people on the bus or having the right people on the team is really what was the key factor that made a good company a great company. And um, so kind of, you know, bringing that forward. And the interesting thing is it's not about being a charismatic leader. It's not about it being flamboyant because many of the top leaders and the top CEOs were actually quite reserved and quiet in the background. But, um, you know, really having that, that good uh, team of people out there. And on that thought, we often see great leaders when they move and they transition from one organization to another or, in our case, from one project to another. They tend to bring great people with them. So we rarely get, you know, a truly great leader it doesn't usually show up, you know, kind of solo and build the team. They often have their, their um, you know, their their team come with them. So with that in mind, we're going to move forward in our, in our session today and we're going to be taking a look at um, some factors around uh, having the right people on the bus. I'm going to revisit our challenges from the first session. So if you remember back our very first session, we identified and asked you to say, what were some of the challenges that you encounter in your work as project managers? And this was our list. Now, as we're going through our steps, we're going to be addressing some various ones. So the ones that we're going to be looking at today is, first of all, around communications, uh, getting support from senior management and people conflicts. 
I'm not highlighting these three because as we look at roles and responsibilities, again, getting the right people on the bus, this can help with the communications issues. This can help with getting the support from senior management, and this can help with uh, the people conflict side. So if we kind of focus on getting the right people there, some of these issues, some of these challenges that we face tend to subside or, you know, almost address themselves. The uh, multiple beside communications was that we had multiple entries or multiple responses that said um, communications was an issue. Now, again, revisiting from the first session, what is a project? And I'm just going to focus in, first of all, it's carried out by people. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, it's carried out by people. So we don't have people. We don't have a project. In the past, PMBOK um, has been more focused on, on, on the process and on the steps. And oftentimes, project managers, uh, we get into projects and we, we read PMBOK and we go, you know, we, we have our methodology for our organization and we, we follow the steps and we check off the boxes. But that's not enough. Um, yes, we do need to do that, but we want to think about the essence behind a lot of those, those steps and those, those boxes we're checking off. Why are we doing that? And a big part of it is, it is the project is being carried out by people. And hence, we need to have the right people there with the right skill sets, the right attitudes, the availability, um, so that we can you know, get the job done, because it is carried out by people. When we talk in terms of constraints, time cost is absolutely there. Uh, we also get into a constraint around resources. So do we have the resources that we need? <clears throat> and of course, we're talking human resources. Now, we're also talking uh, other resources, such as equipment and supplies. But at the end of the day, people are a resource. So we need to make sure that we're getting the right people there, getting them there at the right time, uh, engaging them, making sure that we're dealing with the issues, and so forth. So step three, roles, responsibilities, and estimating. Now, in our 10-step methodology, the reason that we bundled these two is that if we don't identify the roles and responsibilities first, we will not be able to effectively estimate. And like I said, we're going to touch on estimating near the end of our time today. But just want to kind of plant this seed. If we put resource A versus resource B in, so if we have Sam come in and do the job versus we have Dave come in and do the job, well, that's two different resources. They're going to take two different amounts of time to get the job done. They might have two different costings. So when we look at estimating, and again, ideal world, if we can get the resources identified first and then do the estimating second, and a good scenario I like to use around this is we're going to build a, we're going to build a house, so we need to dig a hole for the foundation, and that hole needs to be you know 20 feet long, 30 feet wide, six feet deep. So if I hand out a shovel to get this done, so I give one person a shovel, well it's going to take let's say 60 days. So of course if I end up two shovels or three shovels, we can get it done faster. But what if I gave the person a backhoe, right? So instead of it taking 30 days, it might take one day or two days. So if we can identify the role responsibilities first, and the resourcing first, and then do the estimating, we're going to be a far better job of doing our estimating. So just to recap, <clears throat> we're here on step three. Now, if you remember from our previous session, we talked about business need. We talked about product scope, and we talked about project scope. So our business need, and I really want to emphasize the word business need, because we often talk about the needs or the the, the requirements and you know using our example that we used before of you know the person walks into a, a car dealer and says I need a minivan well, no they don't need a minivan they need transportation the product scope that's the minivan and what defines the product scope is the need so if my definition of my need is really about um, fuel economy so I need to reduce my costs for getting from point A to point B then that's really going to drive which product uh, I'm going to put on the list. So hence, you know, sadly, the Porsche is off the list. The project scope is the how. How are we going to get there? What's the work that's going to produce that deliverable? And we identified the documents that kind of, you know, encompass these. So our charter really identifies our need, a little bit of the, the product scope. The scope statement fleshes out and details out that product scope and into the project scope for the how. So now we're going to look at the team which is really going to support the project scope. So if I don't have a team in place, the work's not getting done, hence we don't have the deliverable to deliver when we're done. 
So our first question for today is what is, what are some of the key roles on a project? Okay, so Lauren, if you could bring the question up, please. So you should be seeing the question screen now. Okay, where do I find those? So I'm just looking for the questions. Okay, so I'm not seeing the questions. The responses. Will you be able to see the responses? Sorry, a little, little technical difficulty here. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm seeing it now. So I need to pop that out. There we go. Excellent. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at some of the ones that we have here. Okay. Nope, nope, that's not what I was looking for. Okay, Lauren, could you read off a couple of those? I'm, I'm having a little bit of technical Sponsor, difficulty. Sponsor, analyst, project manager, end user, uh, SME. Okay, yep. Yeah. Analyst, um, requirements, identification. Requirements, identification, great. Stakeholders. Stakeholders, oh, I love that term. Team lead, scheduler. Team lead, scheduler. So a lot of very, very, very technical roles that are, that are being identified, absolutely. Um, some key ones there, such as the sponsor, the team leads. Um, we want to be thinking about what are some of the key roles that need to be played on our project. So we'll just take a, a quick short list of what we're looking at. And, I've, and I'm using the term role in a, in a much more of a generic sense. So we're going to start off with the customer. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about senior management, support, or sponsor, excuse me, um, the project manager, the team member, as well as, as kind of our, our key roles here. Now, the customer's job is really the acceptor. Now, just before we continue down to working through all of these, keep in mind that we're talking the role, not the person. So I can have one person play two, two or three different roles. So for example, I might have my, my customer might be Greg. And Greg is also my sponsor on this project because he's the one you know, coming to me and saying, okay, I'm going to fund this project, I'm going to do that. But Greg's actually going to play two different roles when he does that. So when I need him to accept the deliverable, um, he's playing the role of customer. When I need him to uh, increase funding or, or I need some support to overcome a particular barrier, he's now playing the role of sponsor. So we can have different people play different roles. So the role of the customer is really around the acceptor. And as we saw in our previous session, we want to make sure that when we talk in terms of acceptance, that the acceptance criteria has been defined at the beginning of the project, um, because what we don't want to do is get to the end of our project and have the, um, the, the customer, the acceptor, go, well, no, that's not acceptable because of this criteria. And it's like, oh, well, I didn't know about that criteria at the beginning. Had I known, I would have, I would have changed how I'm going about it. The senior management is another role that is often not considered when we put together projects. And senior management's role is the funder. They're the, they're the approver of the project. They're the ones who say, yes, go ahead. And we think in projects in terms of an investment to the organization. So if you are running a three-year project for $2 million, what you're effectively doing is you're going to senior management, you're saying, give me $2 million and give me three years of time. And their answer, the response back is going to be, why? Right? What's in it for me? So how am I going to, as an organization, benefit from this investment? Your senior management is going to make that call and that decision. So hence, your project is either going to get funded and approved, or it's going to get rejected and put on the shelf. And the, the, the annoying scenario is it gets funded and approved, and then another project comes in that's actually more important. So hence your funding and, and support gets yanked off. If I can better identify the reason why and I can get that funding and I can get that approval, I can have a better time of having support from my senior management in terms of giving me funding and giving me resources to get this project done. So if we can, um, as, as we talked about in our last session, if we can better identify that, then we're going to have a better chance of, of going forward. But it's our senior management who does that funding. So we want to think about their role in our project and who they are, who we need to engage, and how we need to engage them. 
Our sponsor, very simply, is our supporter. Now, when I ask people, you know, what's the role of the sponsor, usually the first answer that I get back is um, the sponsor is the funder, the, the person who gives us the money, which is true. However, depending upon the structure of your organization, the sponsor is often my connection to senior management, and it's actually senior management who makes the decision. Very oftentimes, the sponsor is going to have some funding limits, and they will work within those funding limits. So we want to be thinking about, okay, what level of authority do they have? Where do I need to go? And you know, can, can they um, make the authorization? Can they make the decision? Do they have to send it up the food chain to a higher level? You know, what does that look like? And we want to define our governance around the project to figure out who are we going to be talking to. And hence, this will also give us some indication of how long things are going to take. Because if, if I only need to go to my sponsor, if I just go to Greg and say, hey, Greg, can we do X? and he can make the decision, he's prepared to make the decision, probably going to get a decision relatively quickly. If, however, he has to go up the food chain to talk to Brian or Catherine or Sam or Bill, then, you know, this might take longer, and we might need to have a more formal process in place. And so, you know, we want to kind of put all that together and, and really understand it so that I know the environment that I'm working within. Your project manager, surprise, surprise, they're the manager. Now, I'm going to just jump down to the team member, and then we're going to kind of sort of contrast the two. Your team member is a doer. Okay? It's a word. Um, so the doer is the one who does the work. So we want to get the right people on the job for sure, but we also want to remember that as project manager, our job is to manage the project, not do the project. Reality sets in, of course, and we have the small project with three people on the job. One's going to play the role of project manager. The other's going to do the work. and you know, we're, we'll get into this sort of trade-off. So yes, there are going to be projects where you do some of the work, and you're going to play the role of doers. And you're now actually playing two roles. And you want to make sure that you periodically take off your doer hat and put on your project manager hat. Because as long as you're doing work, your project's technically a drip. This is kind of a hard thing for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. And it's very easy for us to get distracted by the details of what we need to do, what effectively has been assigned to us, and then we stop managing the project as a more whole. So the other word I like to put beside project manager is the word integrator. So a project manager's job is to integrate the work back into the project. Um, and what I mean by that is take the product that we've got and integrate it back into the environment. So get it to the end users, get it into production if we're, if we're talking in terms of software or if it's a procedure, uh, get that procedure now into the business unit so that it can be used and, and be put in place and leveraged. And keeping in mind what we were saying earlier about the investment, so we've just spent $2 million in three years, um, what's the benefit here? And if that product that we've created does not get put into use, well, we've just wasted that amount of money. Okay? So we want to we make sure that we're, we're playing you know, the appropriate roles. When we get into larger projects where we have 10, 20, 30, 50, a couple hundred team members, we now get into a level where um, the effort of managing the project becomes big enough to occupy an entire resource or potentially even a couple of resources. So we now get into the scenario where you can have the full-time project manager, and you can justify that because of the size of the project and the complexity. So we're going to pose the next question, which is the word stakeholder. And as anticipated, I thought that the um, stakeholder answer would come up on the um, stakeholder answer would come up on the list of questions of what are the roles. So I want to just now define the word stakeholder. So Lauren, if you can bring the question up. Okay, so we're we're, we're doing the dual screen thing here because I'm being a little uh, technically challenged today. No, I thought I got the right screen. So if we can answer the question, what is a stakeholder, or define that. Okay, so I do have it over here. I just hadn't scrolled to the bottom. Anyone who's affected the project? Okay, here we go. There, okay, I can see it now. Thank you. Um, so anyone who uh, is affected by the project? Absolutely. Anyone who's impacted by the change? key players in the project, 
Now, we look at that and say, okay, well, those two are actually in concert with each other because we do have anyone who's impacted or perceives to be impacted by the project, indirectly or directly, absolutely. But then we also talk about the key players. So we want to actually separate that out. So when we, we talk about stakeholders, we want to make sure that we're thinking about are we talking to key stakeholders or are we talking, you know, just everyone, uh, anyone impacted by the project, individual or group um, who is requesting the project, definitely. Uh, anyone impacted positively or negatively, absolutely critical interest. So you start to, to decompose that and, and kind of break it down, right? Uh, anyone who has input to the project, yes. We definitely want to be thinking in terms of um, who's going to be impacting or um, uh, inputting to the project. Okay, so great. So if we can take that one down, please. Okay. Now, want to just plant this seed for you. Availability is not a skill. So when we're talking in terms of roles, responsibilities, we, we're starting to do our project plan, we're figuring out what jobs need to get done. We now want to be thinking about who's going to fill those jobs. And too often times, we end up having a person on the project because they're available, not necessarily the right resource. So I go back to our scenario of digging a hole with a shovel. We're going to switch to a backhoe. So now we want to have someone with back operation skills. I don't know if anyone's ever operating one of those, but they're, they're quite difficult to operate because you've got you know, several levers and they do several different things and you sort of got to use them all in concert with each other. So we want to make sure that we're getting the right skill sets to fill the roles. Okay. So where you should be starting is looking at, based on the requirements, based on the product that we're about to deliver and based on the how we're going to deliver that product, we need to now start thinking in terms of, do I have the right skill sets? So when we decompose those three levels in previous sessions, the need, the project's product scope, and the project scope, the product scope is the product, is the resulting thing that when we're done, and then the project scope is the how we get there. And we identify there's a couple of different ways to do that, such as I can buy versus build. Now, if I decide to buy, procure, well, we need skills like contract negotiation. We need skills like um, <clears throat> vendor analysis and, and vendor relationship management. If we're going to build, well, we need building skills. So our chart that I've put up uh, right now is a skills inventory chart. Across the top, we have a number of different skills. So using our scenario of building a house. We need design skills, we need masonry skills, we need, we need plumbing, we need landscaping, carpentry. And we also need project management skills. We want to consider that as well because we want to make sure that all aspects of my project have been accounted for and considered. So taking a look at this chart, you will notice that under landscape, we do not have an X. We have no resource who is able to fill in um, that skill for us. So we have a skill gap. You want to identify your skill gaps. Do we have the right people on the job? If we don't, we need to now somehow bridge that gap. And we can do this by bringing a new person in. We can do this by uh, training someone up. Um, and when we bring that person in, now it becomes a question of are we looking at a full-time resource, i.e. we reach out to our organization and find someone within the organization who has those skills that we can get onto the project. Or do we bring in a subcontractor? Do we bring in someone from the outside? And depending upon your scenario, um, et cetera. So one of the first places we want to look on this chart is looking vertically. Do I have a, uh, a resource under each of those skills? And if, if not, then I have a skill gap. Now, I also want to consider um, how many resources I have per skill. So if you notice under design and PM, I have only one resource under each of those, Jenny. So with that in mind, can we run our project this way? Short answer, yes, absolutely. However, we want to consider, am I exposing myself to some risk here? You know, do I want to mitigate that? Um, is that acceptable? If we're into very key roles, you know, I might want to, you know, closely manage that. Um, you can absolutely run a project this way, and it's not, I'm, look, I'm saying you've got to have multiple X's in each column. No, if you have multiple X's in each column, that's a bonus, right? We need to have at least one. Now, under design, I know who I'm going to get. If I get into masonry and plumbing and carpentry, for example, I actually have two X's in each of those columns, so therefore I have some flexibility. So I can drop in the masonry, I can put Joe or Wayne on the job. 
And that way, if one's not available, especially if that's the pre preferred one, um, then I do have a backup. So I mean, it does afford me some flexibility. Considering also horizontally now, I take a look at Joe, and Joe's only got one, re one, one skill, masonry. Now, that means Joe is probably a very good mason, right? Um, same with Sally under plumbing and, and Bill under carpentry. Um, we look at Wayne, and Wayne has masonry, plumbing, and carpentry. So, you know, without further information here, my inclination is that Wayne is probably a bit more of a jack-of-all-trades where Joe, Bill, and Sally are more specialists and, and potentially masters in those areas. Um, and again, this affords me flexibility because now I've got someone, Wayne, who I can pop into a couple of different um, parts of my project based on his skill set versus Joe is, is more limited on his skill set. But we, we find that balance off because usually when you find someone who's got you know, single skill sets or into a more uh, specialization, often a, a higher level of quality um, for that resource. And again, we you know, have those discussions with our resources and, and kind of sort that out. These are some of the areas you want to look at when you're doing your skill inventory. And the skill inventory is not, and I'm going to emphasize this, the skill inventory is not a RAM, a resource assignment matrix. Now, a RAM, a resource assignment matrix, is really um, often referred to as a RACI or a RACI. And it is about who has what job so notice we're not identifying jobs here, we're identifying skill sets. This leads us to the question of what is the right stuff? So I'm going to pose that question to our team here. We're thinking about, we've got our project, we've got our plan, we're going to be bringing the team on board. So I want to ask that question, what is the right stuff? So Lauren, if you can bring that question up. And now that I've figured out how to see the answers myself. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, so someone said I didn't see the answers. Um, unfortunately, our software, our technology doesn't allow us to display the answers as they come in. So what I do is I just read them as we go. So my apologies, I should have mentioned that. So the right people with the right skills is the first answer. Absolutely. Okay. So what else? What is the right stuff? Someone who's engaged. Ooh, I like that one, Lori. Thank you. Yes. So we're now starting to look at skills versus attitude and engagement. Beautiful. Um, skill to get the job done. Yep, absolutely. Ooh, here's a long one. Uh, individuals with a balance of both needed skills and the right fit for the culture of the company. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Sarah. That's an excellent answer. Um, also, the tools to get the job done. Interesting. Um, so, uh, Debbie, if you wouldn't mind, if you could expand on that a little bit, what do you mean by the tools? get the job done. Oh, people with work ethics. Love it. Yes, absolutely. Just give it another moment or two for any additional answers. Hoping to get some explanation on the tools to get the job done. Okay. Flexibility. Mm, yeah, I like that one. Yeah, because too often times we get people who are very, um, um, for lack of a better word, rigid or kind of stuck in their ways. Oh, great. Here's the, the additional on the um, tools part. Uh, it's great to have the right people in the right place, but if you can't provide the tools to get them done, uh, the team won't function to optimal performance. Oh, totally agree. Absolutely. So we need to not only have the skills, but we also have to have the tools to get the job done. Because if I give you the tools without the skills and vice versa, you know, things don't work. Um, so some additional ones, uh, people who believe in the project. Um, so there's that, so that whole motivation piece. Uh, some transferable skills. Interesting. Yeah, because we can often uh, do mentoring and, and train people up uh, working that way. Some people who are accountable and passionate for what they do. Oh, these are some fabulous answers. You guys know what you're doing. I love it. Okay, so we can close that um, down. Thank you. Okay, so here are some of the uh, the answers that I put down for this one. First one, resourceful. Okay, and the, you know we can we can go into some great discussions around what is resourceful. Um, the thing that I look at when I talk about resourceful is I like to look at it from the standpoint of um, you know are they able to deliver? So 
resourceful can be both I have the abilities and the tools but also that that whole you know that attitude to get it done the perseverance huge issue um, we need someone who's going to persevere through we need people who are willing to take on the challenges and, and keep going even when the, the going gets tough right uh, flexibility we talked about you know the whole we've identified the need we've identified the product we've identified the how and one of the things I like to say around project management is we need to identify the destination but remain flexible on the path. So when we talk about um, you know, what, what does success look like, and, and we often see a straight line you know, from point A to point B, well, success actually looks like this, where we kind of you know, do this to get there. Because the fact that we've reached the destination is really what defines project success as opposed to you know, necessarily the path, so having that, that flexibility. And then the creative piece, because you know, problem solving, we get into problems all the time. We need to, you know, be creative how we're going to get the job done. And this is also the part of the reason why we like to separate out the product scope and the project scope, because the product scope is our destination, it's our features and functions, it's our tool, it's our it's our deliverable. The how we get there, we can be creative about that. And then finally, a sense of humor. And you know, sense of humor I think is very important because it's going to be stressful. Um, I had a student once years ago. It's pretty funny. Um, he was in my class, and he was, he was an older gentleman. He was kind of in the, um, in the, let's say, the awesome of his career. And uh, he said in a very loud voice during the class, and this is a project management class, he said, I know why anyone wants to be a project manager. You just have a target on your back. And in a lot of ways, you know, what he was saying is very true. Um, we do tend to, as project managers, often bear the blame, bear the brunt of, you know, hey, you didn't get this done, or, you know, this failed because of you, et cetera. So, you know, sometimes we need to have that sense of humor because things can get very stressful. Um, we need to be able to work at that optimal level of stress. You know, sometimes we need to uh, laugh it off a little bit, right? Sort of that water off the duck's back piece, right? So, yeah, we, we want to have fun along the way. So I'm going to pose another question for you. We're going to do this one as a poll. You're given a choice. And I know I'll, you're all looking at this going, it's not versus, it's and. And I agree with you, by the way. Um, but we're going to do the poll here, and let's just pose the question. If you had to choose attitude or technical ability for your project, you're going to be forced to choose one of those two. So uh, what, would you, uh, what would you choose? Okay, getting some answers coming in. 40% voted. 46% voted. Ooh, it's like the, the, the elections. <laughs> Hope everyone got out to vote yesterday. I did. Um, it was actually really high turnout. It's unusually high turnout, which is awesome. So, yeah. Okay, so we're at 83% voted. So we've actually, we're doing better than the provincial election because I think there was about 50%. So 83%. And we have overwhelmingly 87% uh, saying attitude, 85% oh, attitude, 15% uh, technical ability. So we've got 85% voted. Awesome. So we're looking at about 85 to 15%. So 85% saying attitude, 15%. Technical ability, great. So we can close that down. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so when we talk in terms of attitude versus ability, and, and I totally agree because everyone's probably saying right now, you need both, which totally agree, you do need both. Um, hmm, I just lost my feed. Are we are we still good over there? Everything's still functioning? I just have my 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 webcam thing disappear. There we go. Okay, I think we're back up. We had a little little glitch there. So we had 85% uh, of people voted in our poll, technical ability versus um, uh, attitude, and it was 85% technical, uh, sorry, 85% attitude and 15% technical ability. Um, I, and you know what, I'm, I'm there with you, I totally agree. We're often, because we're on such short timelines and because we're under such pressure to deliver, uh, we tend to sometimes, under the heat of the moment, tend to go for the technical ability. And then, of course, there's the argument where, hey, this is a short-term project. It's, you know, I've only got the person for, you know, a month or two or maybe six months. And I need them to be, you know, hit the ground running and so forth. But, you know, at the end of the day, personally, if I had to choose, I would take attitude over technical ability because we can train the technical ability. And, you know, we ask this question from a hiring perspective. It's like, oh, technical or attitude for sure, absolutely, because we can train technical ability. And, you know, we think of that in terms of the longer term, but we often, you know, get swayed the other way for the short term uh, when we turn, talk in terms of projects. So my personal contention is I think we should be, we should be hiring people both long term, short term. Um, I would take attitude over technical ability. Now, should you have that serious skill gap? 
um, we can bring people with technical ability in who might be lacking on the attitude side. But then how we will leverage them now becomes a question. They might not be the best person to put on the floor getting the job done. Perhaps what we need to do with those folks is uh, leverage them, sneeze, um, you know, subject matter experts, uh, do some knowledge transfer, perhaps uh, get them to coach or, or train up some people, or you know, just use them as advisors and get the people with the, the attitude to actually do the work. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a tough question and it's definitely very situational, but it's, uh, you know, I think it's something to think about. Okay. So selecting the right stuff. Um, when I was putting this webinar together, I started to look at, well, we need the right stuff. And I thought, oh, there's that movie, The Right Stuff. And then I thought about Apollo 13 and the whole space program and what a huge success that was. So I thought I'd use an example today from Apollo 13. And many of us have seen the movie. If you haven't, it's a great movie. Go rent it. I know it's like 20 years old now, but it's, it's still a very good one. So we look at the, the characters in play here. We had Jim Lovell, who's the flight commander, uh, Fred Hayes, who's the lunar module pilot, and then Jack Swigart, who was the command module pilot. And if you read the history of this, it's actually a very fascinating story. It's, it's a great story of uh, triumph over adversity. Um, this crew was actually not the original crew for Apollo 13. Um, so the original crew was, was um, uh, swapped out. And in fact, and I've forgotten which one it is now. I just have done my head. Um, one of them was actually not supposed to be there. Um, and he was a last minute sub in because the, uh, the other gentleman was uh, sick with the, I think it was the German measles or something. So, you know, having the right people there is really a big factor in, in getting that job done. And we look at um, the experience that they went through and some of the perseverance and, and um, you know, technical ability and attitude that they brought to the table. <clears throat> the person I want to focus in on today, however, is Gene Krantz, the flight director of White Team. Now, Gene, um, he's a, a long-term uh, veteran at, up at uh, NASA. He was there for the entire space program. Uh, they the entire, well, actually the entire space program from their early testing of rockets um, on the ground. And famously in the movie, he was the one who said, you know, uh, failure is not an option. And sorry to burst everyone's bubble, but um, he actually never said that in real life. <laughs> so that was the, the catchphrase that kind of sold the movie. So in researching this, um, I, did, I did come up with a couple of uh, Gene Kranz quotes that I wanted to share, which I thought were, were very poignant. So the first one, um, and this actually came out of his memoirs after the movie was written. Um, the memoir was actually called uh, Failure is Not an Option. Um, he basically was, was being interviewed and said, um, quote, when bad things happen, we just calmly laid out all the options. And failure was one of them. So, you know, failure was one of the options. Uh, we never panicked and we never gave up on finding that solution. So when we, we think about that, and if you can remember back to the movie, there's that iconic scene where he walks into the room with a whole bunch of stuff in his army, lays it out on the table and he says, we need to make this fit into this using all of this, right? So, you know, they, they basically were trying to put a square peg into a round hole and they had a bunch of miscellaneous stuff to enable them to do that. And I think this quote really embodies uh, what they were portraying in that scene, which is, you know, they didn't panic. It was calmly laying out the options. They started investigating and, and considering how to do this. And then, um, you know, look for that solution, and they, they started to get really creative. And when the when they first had the incident, when the oxygen tank um, exploded, um, you know, they started getting creative because the way the system was designed is that the lunar module would separate from the command module. It would go down, land on the surface, come back, recouple with the command module, but then it would be jettisoned, and the command module would solo by itself fly back to Earth. So the explosion happened about three quarters of the way to the moon. And they kept the lunar module with them as using it as a lifeboat to get themselves home because the command module was not designed uh, to do what it needed to do, which was to support three humans for that extended period of time. Um, so it's kind of interesting how they, they you know, used the tools at hand and used, used what they had at hand to, to really come up with a good solution. And I think it's a great example of having the right people on the job because had they had some people who weren't as good on the job, they probably would not have made it back. So the second quote, um, and this is more talking about uh, Gene's reflections on um, the rest of the team at NASA. He says, they were a people who were energized by a mission. And I mean, we just asked you that poll question, you know, like, what is the right stuff? And, and there was a, a response back around, 
you know, people who are engaged and people who are, are, you know, their heart and soul into the project and things like that. And when you look at the space program, um, especially in, you know, in the 60s, th they were truly engaged in, into that program. And I think this is really, when you look at NASA today, where it's kind of waned, and you know, this is really what we're talking about, because people, they were, they were energized by the mission. They were energized by what they were doing, and it really had an impact, and they were, they were behind it 100%, right? So these are people who are energized by mission, and these teams uh, were capable of moving right on and doing anything America asked them to do in space. And when you look at the technical um, challenges that they overcome and, the, and the, the sheer magnitude of things and just the, you know, how it all works, it's amazing. And it, it still amazes me today um, how we're able to actually do that and, you know, overcome all of those challenges and, and, and make this thing work. Now, although he never said failure is not an option, he was very famous for saying tough and competent. And this actually came out much, much earlier than the, the uh, moon program. So in the early days of the space program, they were doing um, a test launch. Uh, they're going to put three astronauts into orbit. And the, uh, the rocket actually exploded on the pad, and the three astronauts were killed. And then up until the Challenger disaster, um, these were the only lives lost in the entire space program, which is, which is pretty amazing when you consider what's going on. And out of that, um, and Gene was actually the flight director for that launch, and out of that, Gene famously quote, coined his, his, his catchphrase, which was tough and competent. And this is something that really defined him and, and his team uh, going forward. I'm just going to break those two down for you. The tough side was making those tough decisions. And basically what happened was NASA was pushing forward, and they were pushing ahead to move the program ahead faster than they should have, and they were, they were putting effectively lives at risk. So, in the fallout of that, he says, this is the price, or this is the cost of admission for the flight director and the flight director team. You need to be tough. You need to be able to stand up and say, no, we're not launching today because this isn't right. We haven't got all of our ducks in a row. And that can be a very difficult thing. And we saw that come out in the question of what makes the right stuff. And someone said, well, you need, they need to be accountable. And this is really what we're talking about with the accountability piece. But we also need to be competent. So when we say we can do X, we actually do it. Right? So we need to be tough to be able to stand up and say, no, we can't do X, or X isn't the right thing at this point, but we also have to be competent that when we do say we're going to do X, that we can actually carry through with that. And I really love the, the kind of simplicity and, and holisticness of this. And that mantra of, of tough and competent, I think was a key element that really brought the space program through to its successful, um, well, the Apollo program, at least, through to its successful conclusion of you know, putting a man on the moon you know, multiple times and, and not losing a life um, after that initial um, accident. Um, Gene then, of course, retired, as people do. And then we get into the more modern day NASA when we get into um, the space shuttle and flying the shuttle and, of course, the Challenger disaster. And if you take a look at the um, factors that led up to that, um, they lost the tough part because the uh, engineers uh, were, were pushing forward and saying, you know, we have a problem here. The O-rings are failing. It actually had multiple O-ring failures before the uh, Challenger disaster, but in, as with all aviation-type systems, there's redundancies. So when we talk about, you know, the O-ring failed, and that's what caused the disaster, well, no, what happened actually is two O-rings failed. So they had had a couple of O-rings fail before. The first one failed, the second one uh, stayed. Um, but they realized that there was an issue, and basically what happened is on the Challenger uh, accident, uh, both O-rings failed. So they knew that the problem was there. They knew that it was going forward, but they weren't being tough enough to um, being, being allowed. And that really was a management issue, where management wasn't allowing that to go forward, and, and that can be a, a very difficult thing. <sighs> so um, let's talk a little bit about team development. Now, the question is, you know, what is a team? It's a group of people working together, same goal, same, same process or methodology. And we talk about a team. Now, you put a bunch of people into a room together, you don't have a team. You have a bunch of people in the room. So when you bring a team together, and this is the Tuckman model, you need to go through forming, storming, norming, performing, um, and you will go through those stages. In my life as a trainer, and in fact, my projects are one, two, three, five days long. And then I go and do a new project. And the team is the students in the room. 
So we go through this and actually see this. And you know, after I learned the Takumi model and started uh, thinking about it, I was I was you know being observant and applying it to the room, and we totally do go through it. Um, so as our as a our job as project managers is to help the team move through these cycles. So starting with forming, people coming together, we tend to see polite, guarded, business-like behaviors. Um, we get into storming, people are confronting. Uh, there's control issues, you know, people are jockeying for position and so forth. In norming, we've now confronted those issues. So, so we, people are confronting each other and then we confront the issues. Um, and we start to get procedural. We start to get, you know, a little bit more team oriented. We start to kind of figure out where things should be. And then we move into care, uh, into performing, excuse me, where we see caring, trusting, uh, flexible work environment. This is where we really start to see people supporting each other. Now, this is a circle. So you notice that the arrow from performing continues right on back into forming. And one of the things I think a lot of people miss on this model is the fact that when someone leaves the team or someone comes into the team, you are now back in forming. Okay? And usually you move out of forming through storming norming faster, assuming that you've actually done a good job as a PM of uh, putting your team together and, and helping them gel as a team. When you have transitions, new person come in, person leave, that kind of thing, you'll tend to find that the team will reform itself fairly quickly and get through storming and get back into performing relatively quickly. Now, the other thing we've got to consider, though, is if we don't have a transition in the team, we're sitting over and performing, we can jump straight over to storming if there's an issue. So when we have an issue arrive, it's a personality issue, it's a technical issue, we can, we can hop into storming, and I'm sure you've all been there. You know, you're doing the status meeting, project's going to red, and you start to get the blame game happening, and as I like to say, people sit around a round table and point left, it, you know, who's the fault, and things like that. And what's happening now is that we're moving out of performing, and we've, we've transitioned down into uh, storming. So we want to be, you know, very cognizant and, and aware of that, and, and do what we can to help the team move. Now, there's a fifth element here, which is adjourning. And adjourning, um, I liken this to a funeral. So work with me on this. Um, when you have, when you lose a member of your team, okay, and hopefully that we're not doing a funeral at the end of this. So someone leaves the team. Um, there is for the team that remains. Well, you'll either be happy or sad, really, because I mean you might be happy that they're leaving, like thank God we got rid of Joe, or you might be sad. It's like oh Gord's leaving. Oh no, we like Gordon. He's great, and we don't want him to go. So the team. Let's use the second scenario. The team kind of moves into a bit of a state of mourning almost. And that's why I kind of use the analogy of a funeral because we need to adjourn the old team and now reform, storm, norm, perform the new team. And especially if that departure is at a higher level. <clears throat> so um, you know, using examples from my history, um, we were on a, a large project, it was a multi-year project, we had a large team. And the person who formed the team and started, we'll, we'll call him Gord, um, he left and he announced his departure after a couple of years. And there were literally people in the room crying because, I mean, this guy was amazing. Um, when he retired a few years later, half the team was there, uh, you know, celebrating his retirement. But, you know, how he handled that and, and you know, by, by having the celebration, by, by, you know, giving the team time to come together and, and buy the jokey gift and, and do all the stuff. And, um, Part, part of our celebration, actually, well, when we did his, his farewell, is we actually uh, we, we tied him to the chair and told him he's not allowed to leave and, and we're keeping him. So we, we had lots of fun with that because, of course, we took pictures and posted it on the website and you know, lots of stuff. Um, but it really helped the team um, process and accept the loss, right? And it can also help the team uh, process and, and accept the, you know, so if we use the Joe scenario where we've got a team member who we don't necessarily like, and we're actually kind of happy they're going, well, we're back into farming, and we've got to kind of figure out how is this going to work post-Joe. Post I mean, as much as we need to figure out how is it going to work post-Gord, um, we also have to need to figure out how it's going to work post-Joe. So, I mean, there is both sides, but adjourning is an important piece. And, um, and then there's the ultimate adjourning, of course, uh, when we close down the project at the very, very end. And we want to think about, you know, how can we help the team transition back into um, their, you know, their day jobs, as it were. The other thing I wanted to just touch on very briefly is the concept of situational leadership. Um, when we're talking HR, when we're talking the teams and the resources, we need to be working with those people. Um, and we like to use the Hershey uh, Blanchard's situational work, um, leadership model 
And I'm just going to touch briefly on the on the two um, axes here. So we've got the tasks on the on the left, on the y axis, so low to high, focus on the task, and we've got focus on the relationship. And a way that I like to look at this is I think of it as a bank account. And when I'm focusing on the relationship, I'm making a deposit into the bank account. And when I'm focusing on the task, I'm actually making a withdrawal. And we think about those people in our lives that we've known for many, many, many years. Um, for me, it's Gary, um, a dear friend who I met actually in uh, grade eight. Um, he showed up at uh, like the day before, the week before um, March break, and we spent March break is you know riding around our bikes around the neighborhood together and stuff, and just became fast friends ever since. So there's a lot of deposits I made in that relationship bank over the years, and I can I can pick up the phone and call him and you know focus on the task and say, dude, need your help, and he's there, and vice versa. So we want to think about how can we, as the project team leads, um, you know, make some deposits into that relationship account so that I can actually make some withdrawals. And if we think about the uh, telling form of leadership, um, or as I like to call it, the barking, <laughs> you know, we tend to degrade the relationship while we get the task done. Um, participating, yes, we get the job done, but we're kind of putting two or three resources on it. We're not kind of focusing. The purpose there is not focusing on the task as much. It's around building that relationship. And then, of course, when we delegate, we're we're lower lower focus on the on the task because we're kind of handing that off and kind of low focus on the relationship. The key to delegating is delegate the right tasks and do them in the right way. So this isn't about dumping. This is about finding the right person to f get the job done and then giving them the authority to do it. And then finally, selling, which is um, you know kind of the ideal, um, but it also depends upon the situation. So this is where walking out of that, I'm going to kind of build the relationship, but I'm also going to get the task done. Well, so it's kind of a, a balanced look on, on both of them. Of course, all of these are on continuums. So one of the things I like to look at is what is the relationship um, like and what is the task like? So if I have a high, high focus on tasks, I might get the job done, but I might destroy some relationships along the way, and that's not really a good long-term model. So we're going to kind of you know, find that right balance. So back to our case study. And we've got about five minutes left, so this should work out perfectly. Um, so if you remember, our case study was Acme Corporation, and Acme Corporation decided to sell off its debt powered roller skate division, and hence they're going to move because we've now got lower offices. So we want to think about what skills are required, who's the best resource for that job, and are they available? And I put the word negotiate in here because I, I had to work negotiate in somewhere. Um, you know, you want to really identify who are the skills, what are the right people for the job. And when I say the right skills, it's not always the technical skills. Oftentimes, the skill might be an attitude uh, skill. So you know, what are the right people for the job? And if they're not available, how about if we fight for them? How about if we negotiate for them? And whether that's in the form of getting them taken off of other resources or other uh, jobs, other projects that they're on and get onto mine, or whether that's perhaps maybe we're going to lengthen the project and, and um, uh, you know, get them onto the, the project. So it's really all about, you know, getting those right people on the bus at the right time. So what were our major deliverables? Well, if you remember, we had the office move, we had the location, we had the renovation, we had the move itself, so we need to hire an agent, investigate locations, and so on. So let's just restructure this a little bit. So here are the jobs, and here are the team that I have available. So we got Daffy and Bugs and Porky Pig and um, Sylvester. Sylvester's not looking so good today. Got Taz, Sam, um, Wiley, and of course Foghorn Leghorn. Uh, just great characters. Um, so hire agents, investigate locations. So we think, well, let's get let's get Porky to do this. Now he's looking a little worried, so maybe not our best resource, but he's got some good experience. So let, let, let's see how he does out. Negotiate leads. I'm thinking Sam for negotiating leads. Uh, he's got a gun, so this this could be a, a good benefit for us in the negotiation. Design. Who else? Wiley. Come on, he's a genius. Um, comes up with great designs. Hire the contractor, um, Foghorn Leghorn. He's, I think he's a good negotiator. I think he's a good, um, he'll get the right, the right people on the job, and so on. So you get the idea of what we're talking about. So we're going to identify who are all the resources who are going to get the job done. I think Taz will be a good resource for the move because, you know, when he moves, boy, things go quick. All right. So we're just going to touch briefly on estimating, um, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. Um, I know I'm using this graphic a lot, but it's so appropriate in project management. We've got to try and find that target. So a quick quote for this. Here's what an estimate is. It's a realistic prediction of what you think will actually happen. Now, 
Let me use a quick sports analogy. So my wife and I, um, we both ride horses. That's where we met at the barn. And we like to watch show jumping. And I love when they interview riders before they go in the ring. They say, Mario, how are you going to do today? He says, I hope I win. Let's think about this. He said, how are you going to do? And he said, I hope I win. So he responded back with a desire, not a prediction. So I entered the Olympics. I'm a casual weekend rider at best. I haven't ridden for a little bit. Um, and they say, Dave, how are you going to do today? I say, well, I'm going to lose. I'm going to come in last. Probably not even finish. Say, but don't you want a medal? Of course, I want a medal. But realistically, prediction of what I think will actually happen, yeah, I don't ride at that level. It's not going to happen. So we want to try to move away from giving estimates that are what we want to hear and give estimates that are what we actually think will realistically happen. And if we can do that, we'll do a much better job. We're going to go into more detail on estimating in step six when we get into cost. So just to wrap this up, um, some key points here. Your scope leads to your skills. So take a look at your scope. What are the jobs that need to get done? Identify the skills that will get that job done. And this is where our project scope really comes to play because our project scope is how we get the deliverable. So are we procuring, so we need to get into contract negotiation skills, or are we building, so hence we actually have to have the, the building skills. Again, availability is not a skill. You do need to manage the team. When the team comes on board, you know what, just putting a bunch of people in the room does not create a team. You need to manage them. You need to deal with the issues. You need to help them work through the, the Tuckman model of um, forming, storming, norming, and performing. You need to manage them appropriately. Uh, so treating everyone the same is not... Um, a good way to deal with, with team members. Deal with the issues early. The earlier I can deal with them, the better. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on that in step seven when we get into risk. And then finally, estimate realistically. Okay. So as much as possible, try to move away from uh, estimates that are desires and move into estimates that are um, uh, estimates that are actually realistic predictions of what you think will happen. Okay. And I see the time has just hit one o'clock. So just to revisit this, get the right people on the bus. Not only get the right people on the bus, but also get the right people on the bus at the right time. And in Jim Collins' um, uh, research, and if you, read, if you read those books, uh, they found the biggest deciding factor in what makes companies go from good companies to great companies is the resources they have. 